If everything is fine, we will start now the meeting. And just as a short start, I will ask uh, Lauren Hudson and Penny um, Evans, who are there from the Media Center, to present themselves. I will ask to both of you what are your name, what are your pronouns, what is your current position, and last, what is the little guilty pleasure that enabled you to cope with this very difficult last year we had, with this very difficult 2020 lockdown year we just had? So, Lauren and Penny, it's up to you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Lorraine Hudson. Uh, my current pronouns are she, her, and my role is Director of Living Lab at Norwest Media Centre. And my guilty pleasure is my local bakery. Uh, uh, we do amazing Portuguese custard tarts. So if you ever get to come and visit us at Norwest Media Centre, maybe I'll get you uh, something from the bakery. And Penny, hand over to you. Thank you. So um, I'm Penny Evans and my pronoun is she, her. Um, I'm at Norwest Media Centre, the factory's director. Um, and my guilty pleasure, I guess, is that I've started to drink more and more oat milk, hot chocolate, and I go to a really lovely chocolatier in uh, Bristol and I'm um, probably putting on weight as a consequence, but it's lovely. Wonderful, thank you very much. And we'll start immediately with your presentation on the Bristol Living Labs at Noel West Media Centre. Hey, I'm just gonna share the screen. Okay, um, so I'm going to start off uh, giving you an overview of Bristol Living Lab and then Penny's going to come in and talk about uh, one of our projects at the end um, and some of her work at the factory. Uh, so we're Bristol Living Lab. Bristol is in the southwest of England. We're a city of a population of around half a million, but the wider area is a, um, a million people. Um, we're a very green city and lots of creative industries, digital technologies. Um, so Bristol Living Lab is a place where citizens, artists, technologists, businesses, public sector organisations come together to co-create ideas, tools and technologies that address local challenges um, and to innovate and explore uh, new possibilities. It's led by us, Norwest Media Centre. We're an arts charity. Um, and we've grown uh, from being uh, originally a photography project in Norwest, which uh, Norwest is a community in South Bristol. And 25 years later, we're a charity uh, with uh, around 30 members of staff. And we use um, arts and digital technologies, education approaches to work with the local community around issues of interest to them and to share learning at both a local um, and international level. Uh, here you can see a couple of pictures of uh, us. So the one on the left is our main building. It's actually a straw bale building. So a very sustainable building uh, where we've got some offices and we hire space. Um, we run school out of school activities. And on the right is our what we call the factory, which is our community makerspace, which Penny runs, which is on a green business park in our own local area as well. And at the bottom, you'll see the uh, logo of the European Network of Living Labs. So we're a member of the European Network of Living Labs. And this is a kind of European and international organization where you apply to be a member and you go through an accredited process. Um, there's over 150 members um, and over the last 12 years I think there's been over 450 members. Um, so there's some kind of common themes of uh, Living Labs that are a member of the European Network of Living Labs and we all use uh, co-creation, uh, we engage with different stakeholders, we use multiple kind of methods and approaches. And it's very much about real life experimentation um, and innovation in communities. So these are a few pictures uh, from some of our projects, um, pictures of equipment in the factory. There's a picture of a frog, which is a sensor that we co-design with the community, people making things, young people 
participating in our kind of informal education program. So we work collaboratively with people from different backgrounds to develop new and creative models for achieving positive social change. And we're based within the community of Nor West. It's an area of about five and a half thousand households in South Bristol. Um, and if you haven't um, been to Bristol, um, so Bristol's a city of extremes, really. Uh, we've got very kind of wealthy areas and those which are less wealthy and um, pockets of more kind of um, disadvantage. So in the um, UK indices of multiple deprivation, our area ranks quite highly in that. So um, we're very much about working with people to try and um, get more equitable approaches so everyone has access to the same opportunities. Uh, these are some photos uh, of Nor West and local people we're working with. Um, and we were named, um, I can't see my slides, <laughs> and in 2017 we were named um, Smart Community. And so we work particularly to ensure the inclusion of individuals and groups at risk of social and digital exclusion to support them to become active citizens with equal active, uh, access to the city opportunities and also uh, to support people who experience discrimination whose voices often aren't heard and who face barriers to living uh, safe and fulfilled lives. So it's about um, equity, it's about diversity and inclusion. And we're what, what's known as a community-based enabler living lab. So I'm sure um, as you get going on your European project, you'll heard that living labs is a term that's used quite widely. There's obviously living labs which are accredited at NO. It's a term used in a lot in academia um, and in different ways. So, but we're very um, community approach about co-designing with our community. So it's about working them around issues of interest to them. Um, and we, as, we act as a kind of broker between citizens and other organizations. So as I said before, we bring together lots of different organizations to work with people. Um, but at the heart of it uh, is this kind of action research approach where continual reflection and evaluation are built into our processes. Um, and we sort of adapt to the changing needs of our community and the partners. Um, we very much use our kind of arts background, so socially engaged arts and participatory design background, um, but we also use other approaches from education, coaching, um, and we've developed our own methodology called the uh, Bristol approach. So whenever we start a project, we're thinking about it from the perspective of what if we are engaging particular people in our community, what are they going to get out of the project? So it's very important to us that the project delivers benefit within the community. Um, and, but obviously we're working within a context that we're uh, participating in lots of different projects funded from different places, such as um, academic funded projects, European projects, kind of uh, community funding from the UK, um, not uh, businesses, so, but at the heart is always uh, this community approach. Some more uh, photos of uh, bottom left houses in Nor West, uh, top left uh, young people's program, uh, people making things, uh, exhibition uh, top, top in the middle. So we have different programmes at the Media Centre um, and I'm just going to give you a very quick overview. Obviously within this masterclass we've only, you only get a kind of quick introduction but we've got the Living Lab programme but we see the Living Lab as something that kind of sits around all our activities so all our activities are part of uh, Bristol Living Lab. We've got the Arts programme, uh, we work with uh, local artists um, everything from sort of print makers to dance to literature um, embedding uh, local artists in our programs we've got the factory which is our community making digital manufacturing innovation space which penny will tell you a little bit more later we've got we can make which is our community-led housing program so that's been going about 
five years and we've been working with the lo local community to look at where they would like uh, new housing in the community and then currently working with them around modern methods of construction so how we can build our own houses in our neighborhood and then learning the school uh, skills and working with local traders and suppliers and um, yeah and, and also putting uh, we've got some first home where we're building I think it's 18 homes over the next two years and we've got just put some planning permission in for the first two We've got also got our sustainable neighbourhoods programme, working with local people around digital skills, sustainability, sharing that with other communities and community anchor organisations in the city. Um, and we've got our young people and emerging creatives programme. So we, I know that your project is very focused on education. So we deliver education programmes. Um, I guess they're what you call informal education in terms of their out of school or university so we uh, we run after school programs but we collaborate with schools on things such as a uh, make a city program which is a digital making program we teach young people around things like coding robotics uh, digital making um, but also very much about working with um, people sort of empowering them and building their confidence and skills and helping to open up opportunities and for them to see the opportunities within the city and further afield and to collaborate with uh, people, uh, you know, other young people at a European level and other types of organisations. So in terms of methodology, we've developed something called the Bristol Approach. This was developed with Ideas for Change, uh, Mara Balestrini, that's an organisation based in Barcelona and Bristol City Council. Uh, you'll see there's a web link here that you can go and find out more about Bristol Approach, but basically it's a kind of uh, participatory design methodology. Um, and it's about putting people and issues at the heart of co-creation. So we work with, when we do a project, we bring together uh, people that are interested in the topic and we look at the issues related to that area that are key core interest to them and then frame how we're going to work with them and how work with them to kind of co-design um, the solutions and to deploy the project and then um, to share um, information and tools through this idea of what we call a city commons which is about um, trying to make uh, resources and things that you create open source and share them with other um, communities which might be other communities in your city or in other communities across Europe or internationally and then uh, finally uh, the evaluation stage. That's only a very quick insight but you can find out a lot more on the uh, website but to give you an idea of types of projects we've used it in, um, it was developed originally in something called the Bristol Approach to Citizen Sensing which I think was started in around 2016 and we, uh, that was a pilot project exploring issues such as how sensing could be used um, to address local people's concerns. And the issues they picked were damp homes, uh, food waste and mental health. So the food waste and mental health projects was working with young people in the city and the others was uh, particularly in an area of East Bristol. And that developed the kind of methodology which was published in uh, Kai, like an academic um, publication, um, but it's also very kind of practical based um, on the ground in the community. We then went on to use it in Replicate, which is a Horizon 2020 project on smart cities, and there we were using it around air quality sensing. Um, we developed these uh, ladybird sensors uh, for monitoring air quality. Um, We've also worked with it on something called How Do You Move? So we work with the University of Bristol around physical activity guidelines for the UK government and improving um, how you would kind of communicate and uh, word those for use uh, within communities. Uh, also worked on Respired, which was another smart city project focused on blue spaces, so that's kind of water. And then uh, more recently, uh, we've got this Parkos project, uh, Horizon 2020, 
which has just entered its second year. Um, that's on participatory science communication. And Penny's going to talk to you about one of our um, case studies for that. Uh, we're also <coughs> working with community in Mexico City, along with the University of Bristol and the university there, which is about sharing our approaches so that they can do um, smart city innovation with a kind of community led approach. And finally, we've just started a new project, which is called Twinergy, another EU project, which is about um, energy digital twins. And that's going to be uh, working with our community again, of deploying technology in around 12 to 15 homes. So that's a really um, quick whiz through Bristol Living Lab, and we're really happy to answer questions. But Penny is now going to talk about a project called Rethink, Remake, Recycle. Great, thanks, Lorraine. So <laughs> maybe your brains have just started to do. Oh, there's a bit of feedback. Okay, <laughs> so I'll start again. Um, yeah, so thanks Lorraine. Great, great um, bit of background. As she said, we've been running for 25 years. So uh, altogether we've amassed a lot of uh, sort of experience and expertise and um, focus and working with the community very much embedded within the local community. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about a project that we have just, <clears throat> we've just started running. Um, as we all know, there's a there's a huge amount of um, waste uh, uh, and various other environmental concerns that are happening. So we've called our project Rethink, Remake, Recycle. And the aim of the project was to work towards waste reduction locally and globally. Um, and we wanted to develop a shared understanding of the ways of how to reduce common household waste, such as plastics or paper. So we've been unpicking the data behind what we waste, and we've been mapping out the different types and properties of waste materials. And we've been following a process of creative design thinking. So prototyping and making to try and identify sustainable solutions and alternatives. And we've been in COVID times, so we haven't had the usual come into our, our spaces, work with us. So we've done this in a very different way. We've kind of used the hybrid approach. Um, so we've blended our, we've kind of gathered quite a lot of digital tools. We've worked across the, um, um, as I'm sure you all have, things like Miro. So we've got interactive boards um, and post-it notes interactively but the, the thing to remember is that not everybody is digitally included not everybody has really broad band width not everybody has access to devices not everybody has a quiet house and a space to work so it's in really important to think about how people access a lot of this and also how they are able to join in and have the opportunity to engage so we, we decided that we would work with families particularly because we knew a lot of families would be at home. And so what we've done is adopted this blended delivery approach where we've combined both physical workshop, physical making and digital. And we've done that by creating packs and we sent packs out to people's houses, got them involved early on. So this is a lot of people who we've been talking to uh, working with other organizations, sending stuff out on Facebook and people coming together around this whole idea of waste. Um, so there have been different things like virtual meetups and instructional videos and webinars and then at home activities. So this running through this thread, thread is um, waste audit. So we've been asking people to gather waste audits as we go. So as you can see, we had a lot of people involved. We had probably about 48 participants in all. Um, and we had various different workshops. So if I just tell you some of the different workshops we've done. So we had a um, create a bio resin pot. Um, and that was sort of about recycling, um, recycling and thinking about how you can actually um, make something out of. So we use pine resin and various other tools to actually create a little pot. Um, and then we also did um, something around um, plastics. So um, a lot of these things, some, some of the machinery we have at the factory, so we've got the shredders, plastic shredders and heat presses and various things like that. 
So a lot of these instructional videos were also showing people actually, once we had the plastic, how we could then convert it. But we were thinking about, you know, what, what kind of plastic offcuts and recycling can you make to create something? Um, we did something around gelatin um, and gelatin based plastic and using agar agar, which is a sort of a plant material um, to make some sort of film. Um, and then we also um, were thinking um, about sustainable gift wraps. So we came up to Christmas, what kind of things could you make or, or use that are sustainable and exciting? Um, and then we were thinking about washable, reusable cloths. So really functional things in the house that you could gather from your waste. Um, and, and we did a lot of talking and discussing um, people were doing activities out of the session, then came back together. Um, they've been talking on Facebook, they've been sharing on Jamboard and those other digital tools. Um, and we've been creating a zine. So we've got this kind of magazine um, that's kind of a combination of ingredients, of um, info, of how to's. Um, and we're hoping with this project that um, we're going to kind of grow it into something where we can think about maybe some micro businesses, maybe some technologies, maybe some AI, where we can pull a lot of that data together and start to influence how people see about their data, where their waste, where it is, um, and then be able to partake interactively in the story of that data, but also to start reducing it. Um, so it's the start of a project. It's a really exciting project. Lots of people are really engaged with it and we feel it's gonna have a bit of a viral spread. So rather than us saying, you're gonna be a part of this project, actually a lot of participants will start talking to other participants and get other people in, involved. And so for key for us overall is around sustainability, which kind of goes back to uh, one of our, our kind of aims and values at the media center, which is around sustainability. We have a straw bale building, so we're not newbies at this. Um, so we can kind of embed a lot of our values and practice with the community working with us to grow a lot of those ideas and thoughts. Um, and so really in a nutshell, that is the project and it will continue to grow. It's got a citizen uh, participation focus. It's got the PARCOS, the European um, project uh, is, is it's begun, gonna become the European project and the case study that we're gonna do. And we don't know where it's gonna go. I mean, that's the exciting thing about it and what technology we're gonna use um, and what things we're gonna create in our West. But it's a really exciting point at which to join us on the journey. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Penny. Thanks a lot, uh, Lorraine, for, for this presentation. Um, I would like just to invite all participants to write their questions, remarks for uh, our two guests today in the chat. While you are doing this, I will start with my very own questions. Um, so, so first of all, I, uh, Lauren insisted on the equity and inclusion uh, aspect of the general ethos of Noel Media Center and in the project. And I was wondering if you could give us some insights about practically, what does, how does this translate practically in your project in any in the way you are doing things or in the way you are choosing participants, how in practice does this, does this translate, this idea of equity and inclusion? Okay, yeah, one thing I didn't say in the talk actually is part of our Parkos project, we're developing guidelines for diversity and inclusion. So actually we're starting to sort of look at our kind of practice and then think about how we bring that together and use that to inform those guidelines. So I guess we it takes everything from how we kind of design, how we do the co-design process, thinking about um, kind of who's involved and how inclusive the process is, So which might be around um, people being able to access, um, get to get involved in terms of um, maybe it's access of spaces, the building, is it accessible to people with a particular disability? Um, how do you engage people that maybe are less likely to get involved? So maybe uh, people from Black, Asian, ethnic, minority communities. Um, sometimes we don't design specific projects for specific groups. So in the Young People's Programme, there's been some projects specifically targeting, uh, targeting young women 
from to get uh, building their skills and confidence to get involved in the creative industry, particularly working with black and minority ethnic uh, communities who are typically kind of underrepresented in those um, types of industries. So there's lots of different kind of aspects to it. Um, and it's thinking about how you make it kind of um, core prep part of all your work and how you kind of social justice is at the heart of, I guess that is it at the heart, as Penny was saying, at the heart of our values as well. Um, so as an organization, we also look at kind of who we you know employ and who's in our trustees and um, as well as the kind of within the projects as well. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have a question from Matteo Mezzagora, who, who, who mentioned you quoted the Zine, the magazine. Um, this, this, you say Zine or Zine in English? Magazine Zine. M magazine Zine. Okay, Zine, <laughs> as a way to, to talk about the project. Is, is, it, is this a standard and usual way to, to involve the wider community, meaning those who are potentially interested by the project but did not actively participate, or do you use different tools for each project? So shall I take this to Lauren? It's, it's, it's one of the ways. Um, I think the zine came out of because we could do that digitally and people could share in the process of creating it. Um, but it's a way to, yes, absolutely tell people about the project and what they do and share the wider, share the wider findings. But um, also for us, it's about, you know, how do you then tangibly show what, what are the tangible benefits of working on a project like this, too? And then that would be a way that people go, oh, well, that's really interesting. Actually, I want to do a bit more, um, you know, reducing my household waste or I can see that um, somebody else has made a pot from something. I'd like to do that, too. So it's just one of the many ways. And in fact, we haven't used a zine for a very long time, but it's a really great way to pull together um, lots of different information in, in, in a fun and accessible way. And I think because there's young people involved in this project, there's a certain amount of probably gamification we're going to be doing. Um, so the zine is, is, is a good way to show to our, um, our other project partners what we're actually doing to show to the community, but also make it accessible and transparent. So it's all very well doing all these highfalutin you know, things and talking about plastics and recycling plastics and all that. But actually people wanna know how to do it and people wanna learn how to do it. So it's very much about how do you embed those skills? How do you share that learning and that knowledge? And, and you know, and knowledge production is a very important thing to us. How do you foster a, a culture of inclusive, inclusivity within knowledge production? How, how are you ensuring that the least represented in the creative sector or other sectors um, can be part of contemporary debate and knowledge, knowledge production. So it's thinking of different ways of doing that and also with different voices, um, you know. So do, do I understand the, that the, the zine is uh, created collectively with the participants? It's co-created as well. Can, can you just well, tell we us? We will be that? getting feedback. We've started the process off. We've been lucky enough to um, have a student, a design student work with us. So she's got some uh, great ideas. So she's, she's kicking that process off. Um, so it's going to start from the, you know, being able to put some things together, but we will be uh, feeding and getting people to share and, and feed in and we'll have quizzes and cross, crosswords and various things like that. Uh, Clementine Bricou is, uh, is asking, what is the media you are using for this zin? Is it defined already? Uh, what is the media? Uh, well, I think we'll probably do, um, well, we're creating it in Illustrator at the moment. Um, but, um, you know, it can, it, we're not sure yet how we will distribute it because it depends. We're hoping that we will have hard copies. We'll probably send hard copies to the participants. Maybe it'll be, you know, across the community, uh, people can pick up and, and share them. But at the moment, this will be kind of um, sent digitally probably or shared as part of um, different, different ways that we might go into the Null West website, might go into the, um, the knowledge, which is a local newsletter. Great. Uh, I will now focus my next question on schools. As you know, Sally's will be focusing on, on working with schools. And you, you mentioned that you are you have been uh, engaging and having living labs project with schools already. And um, I had one question, which was, how do you 
engage with them? How do you mobilize the schools on Living Lab project? And I see Matteo just asked a similar question saying, have you worked with schools as institutions, meaning not only the students and teacher, but the institution itself, including the governance? And if so, how do they perceive the Living Lab approach? I guess, um... I think we've worked with schools over kind of many years. Um, as I said, some of the kind of education we start, we do is uh, after school programs, which is our programs, but we do link up uh, with schools around things like um, Maker City and, and other times we've gone in, we've gone into, well, we go into schools to deliver those maybe at, at the end of the day and to help with like teaching around things such as coding, robotics, digital manufacturing. Um, obviously, uh, I, can't, I can't talk on behalf of the teachers, but I guess I think from what I've seen of the kind of schools program, it's not something I run, is that uh, they actually find that quite useful because in the UK, maybe about five years ago, kind of coding was put on the national curriculum, but it, uh, and it was started at, um, for children at very young, year like five years old. And actually what we found was in schools, many of the teachers didn't have those skills. So often sometimes children are more ahead of the teachers in terms of kind of digital kind of some around digital skills. So it provided the opportunity to provide, um, to help the schools with some of these um, Sort of challenges around delivering what's on the curriculum but also think beyond the curriculum and do something more creative particularly around the sort of digital manufacturing and robotics and AI and lots of things that Penny does at the factory so we're really sort of pushing the boundaries and giving children um, access to uh, stuff that maybe they wouldn't typically access so, Penny, I don't know if you've got anything else you want. Yeah, to Yeah, well, I think I think you know we uh, we we work from schools from the very beginning, and we work with young people. So our first project was working with a hundred young people to to a hundred young uh, hundred voices from Noel West and what they wanted. So it was very much always about you know what what where do you come from? What do people want? What's the motivation? What are the issues? What are the challenges? And how do we address those? Um, and I think. Um, uh, a lot of uh, school, a lot of the way the education system has been kind of traditionally run in, in, in the UK is around the very, very much Victorian model where you've got a, it's like a factory, you've got a child in, they go down this production line and then they're popped out the other end. Um, and what we find is a lot of young people don't, um, don't, don't know how to work in a team very well. Um, or collaborate or share ideas and work together. So a lot of the things that we, I guess, the ways in which we work with schools is to also use that approach where you're co-designing, you're collaborating, you're coming up with solutions, but you're doing that together and you're gathering different people who have different ideas, different expertises, um, so that it's not just that that one one pupil who's digesting all the information and then spewing it back out again but we have they have the ability to think much broader and use different ways of kind of coming at problems or ideas so as you know Lorraine said we you know our focus is around creativity that's our driver through the organization with the co-design approach so it's a living lab but it's also about creativity and thinking about how, what are those approaches, what are those arts approaches to working on these different um, projects and, and issues. Thanks a lot. I, I have one more question and I'm aware we are running slightly out of schedule as, as most participants had blocked until uh, 45. If you are able to stay five minutes more, because I, I think the, the next question is, is quite of interest to us as well. Um, the, um, we, we have two questions related to the issues you are choosing. So the first one is coming from Malvina asking, uh, how do you gather people, people around to share issues? How do you choose the issue or how do you figure it out when, and, when you get, and when you get people to join? And uh, we have an additional question from Gisela Oliveira asking, does the to be engaged community have a word to say on the issue to be chosen? So do you first choose the issue and then grab people to get them inside or do you first get the people and then choose the issue together? 
Okay, so um, so as I was saying, at the heart of the Bristol approach is engaging people around issues that matter to them. Um, so we do it in two ways, really. In some projects, it's really open, and you bring together people, and they choose the issue. So the, when the Bristol approach to citizen sensing was developed, uh, we started with no issue. Um, but in other projects, the issue is a bit more defined, perhaps when we're applying for money. So maybe sometimes in certain projects, you have to have a broad area, um, but then work with people to find out the part of that that is of interest to them. So it, it works in different ways. But what because we have been working in the community for 25 years, then obviously we're kind of, have built long-term relationships with our local community and working with other, sharing with other communities in Bristol. So there are some sort of ongoing themes that we already know of interest to the community, particularly around things like sustainability and housing and skills and stuff. So that also helps us when we're sort of bidding for funds. So we always, when we develop a project, we try to keep it quite open. So when, for example, we're putting in things like EU bids or stuff, we're very careful not to put very set deliverables, very like, because otherwise it's not co-design, because the whole point of co-design is that you're kind of designing, uh, exploring the issue together and finding the solution together. So um, yeah, that's how we, we do it. So I guess, um, yeah, it's very much working with the community, but it's also been clear with the community about what the limitations are because obviously sometimes there are limitations in terms of funding and the time scale and the ability to address issues sometimes at what you can do within a particular project but then if something can't be addressed in one project you're looking for the opportunity in another with another source of funding. I, I think if I can just add to that absolutely um, and, and then also we are very similar to a lot of uh, communities that um, live on the edges of cities and, and have um, high indices of deprivation in that a lot of people are unemployed, a lot of people have bad health, um, there's a lack of housing. So we know, and the, you know, the environmental agenda is really big for everybody. So there's some big, big, broad, you know, issues that affect everybody. Um, and then there's the sort of smaller ones and, and um, you've become more nuanced, but you know, one of the things for us is it's really important to uh, create employment as well. So that might be one of the, the key aims of the project. Thank you very much. I, um, I, I think we're arriving at the end of the time. If I can ask you very quickly to answer this very last question, I'll, I'll take your first one, Malvina, which is, have you noticed the impact or the influence of the No Media Center on your activity uh, and your activities on the community did you did yourself in a very qualitative way have noticed some things changing around that you are maybe are proud of or that you think is linked with what you're doing do, been doing daily for 25 years now i guess i'll start and then maybe hand it over to penny because she's worked in the organization a lot longer than me so just to say that i guess evaluation and measuring the impact is at the core of what we do. So in terms of we have uh, a member of the team who's our evaluation lead, and we always think about what's the impact, what's the difference our projects make? So we've got processes for kind of measuring the impact and working with the community. And that's the whole point of our organization. But maybe if I hand over to Penny in terms of, because she's been in the organization a long time to talk about the kind of wider impact and changes you see. Yeah, well, just I know we haven't got very much time, but very briefly, you know, we we know our we know our practice works. We we had a young woman who came to us um, who is unemployed, who couldn't find a job anywhere. We we created um, a something called with digital producers, young digital producers, and we work with them around skills for web about how to work with the community um, and very much our practice. Um, and that young woman, who's a local Noel Wester, has gone on to be one of the top tech women in the world. So she's now creating 3D prosthetic limbs um, and, um, you know, their business is growing and growing. So she is there out there as an advocate, but she also 
remember like uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, was an unemployed and nobody wanted to uh, work with her. So, you know, there's some real key um, uh, impacts that we can point to, um, you know, and we also know that when we worked with one particular school, that the, we that by the end of the year they were they were in um, uh, they weren't doing very well let's say on the, on the um, scale of uh, of schooling in the UK uh, we worked with them for six months um, and they were at the top and the teachers and the head teacher said we know it's as a direct result of working with you guys so we know our practice works we share it widely we're really interested in about scalability uh, transparency and impact. Um, and yeah, and how we share a lot of our practice. Thank you very much. Thanks. We are at the end of this first masterclass. I'd like to thank very, very much Lauren and Penny for this valuable insight. I think this, there are plenty of things that we, we will rediscuss next week with the, with the partners. Um, thank you very much. If you have questions, if you wake up during the night in your insomnias, uh, and have questions about Noble Media Center, please send it to us. I'd like to thank all the participants who were there and who followed this with attention. And also, of course, the worthy team at the Group Trace, Claudia first, uh, for their great work in organizing all this. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. And we see you all tomorrow at the same time for the second masterclass, uh, this time with a participant of a Living Lab project. Um, uh, yes that will be led uh, from the Netherlands. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Merci. Au revoir. <laughs>